Joe Alston, Superintendent of Grand Canyon National Park. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 1.2 million acres encompassing the treasures of Grand Canyon. Today we'll be unlocking some of those treasures using some unique tools. These may not look like the keys that would unlock some of the oldest mysteries of our world, but by using the rocks of Grand Canyon and artifacts left by ancient Native American cultures, we're constantly able to learn more about this amazing place. The Grand Canyon National Park is only a small piece of the entire national park system. Near your home, the National Park Service is working to preserve a mountain range, a Civil War battlefield, an inescapable prison, a fossil bed, ancient ruins, or towering redwood trees. No matter where you live, the National Park Service is just around the corner. Today I'd like to invite you on a journey into the canyon to help you find the keys to help you unlock the incredible history of Grand Canyon. Have a great trip. Good morning and welcome to Grand Canyon National Park and our electronic field trip into the canyon. I'm Jacob Fillion and I'm a park ranger here at Grand Canyon National Park and I'm joined with by my, with my co-host Tommy. Hi, my name is Tommy Birch. I live in upstate New York and go to Draper Middle School. Right now I'm here with some other children from New York, also children from Florida, Indiana and right here from the Grand Canyon. That's right, Tommy. We're going to take an adventure. We're going to use some of those keys that Superintendent Alston talked about to unlock some of the mysteries here at Grand Canyon. What are some of the things we're going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about geology, like the rocks of the Grand Canyon. Also, the plants and the animals, the living life of the canyon. That's right. We're also going to talk about some of the people who have part of the history of Grand Canyon, some of the early Americans who have been coming here for over thousands of years, as well as some of the recent explorers who came in the late 1800s up to the tourists today. We get almost five million visitors every year at Grand Canyon. Wow! You know, we also have millions of people watching this show from all over the country, and they can participate in our field trip as well. You're right, Jacob. One way you can participate is by calling the number on your screen, 866-279-8716, with a question. Also, you can go to our website, www.bsu.edu slash EFT slash experts, which is also on your screen. Write a question, and you will get almost an immediate response from one of our experts here at the Grand Canyon National Park. Right, Tommy. We got about 15 park rangers and other experts who are 
on the keyboards all the time responding instantly to their questions. And hopefully you'll call in your questions, Tommy and I and our other experts here out at Lippin Point will answer your questions and the experts online will too. You know, Tommy, Grand Canyon became a national park in 1919. It's located entirely in the state of Arizona up in the northwest corner of it. The park is about 1.2 million acres large. Wow. Yeah, that's big. And the Colorado River flows through the whole length of the, the Grand Canyon. You know how many miles the Colorado River flows through the canyon? Um, 277 miles. Good guess. <laughs> Actually, you knew that. The canyon is also about 10 miles wide and about a mile deep. And we're going to explore those things today. We're going to use keys to unlock the mysteries, learn about the geology, the plants and animals, the history, and preservation. What the Park Service mission is to protect and pre preserve those things here at Grand Canyon National Park. You know, and Colleen is here with a lot of those artifacts and those keys to explore. Right, Colleen? Yes, thank you, Jacob. My name is Colleen Hyde. I work in the Parks Museum Collection. We have almost 400,000 items that deal with the cultural and natural history of the park. For the natural history, that includes geology and paleontology. Also includes biology, which is the birds, the animals, the plants, insects, all different sorts of life forms. For the cultural life, we have archaeology and ethnology. We also have history and archive manuscripts, which are collections of documents. Right now, I've got a couple of the students with me, and I'm going to let them show you some of the nice things from the collection. Hi, I'm Ben Giffick. I'm Ben Giffick from Pinewood Elementary School in New York, and I'm holding northern whiptail lizards commonly found throughout the canyon. And I'm Carly Enright from New York in sixth grade in Draper Middle School, and I'm holding a bone awl, probably probably from a deer's thigh, and it was sharpened at the end and used to drill holes in other bone, cloth, other bone, cloth, um, ceramics, and wood. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be coming back later and showing you some other nice things from our collection, but first let's start learning about the canyon. We're going to start learning about the geology of the canyon, and we'll see you later. Great day hiking. Can you read me a story before bed? Yeah, sure. Which one do you want to hear? Oh, tell the Coquinino. No, no. The Kaibab. Kaibab? That sounds like a good story. Let's see. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away. Hi everybody, my name's Jay Johnstone. I'm a park ranger here at Grand Canyon, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the stories that rocks can tell. Now, you may not be aware of it, but these rocks tell incredible stories. You just need to know some of the language, and that language is called geology. Grand Canyon is one of the greatest classrooms on planet Earth to learn about geology because it's the planet's history book opened up for everybody to read. Each one of those layers of sedimentary rock behind me represent another chapter, a story, a continuing uh, uh, evolution and, and development of planet Earth. And we're going to be touching upon a lot of these different techniques and processes. So. We're, let's turn it back over to Colleen and her assistants. I believe they've got some beautiful rocks to share with you, and uh, trying to, uh, and they will try to tell you the stories of those few rocks. Colleen, thank you, Jay. We have quite a few artifacts out here, different fossils and rocks that can be found in the Grand Canyon Museum collection. And Ben and Carly are going to tell us about a couple of their favorites. Here, I'll hold it. <laughs> well, this is a fossil of. Uh, Brachiopod, and which is an early sea clam, and this is a fossil of a sea sponge, which are still found in oceans today. What do you have, Ben? I have a trilobite. I have a trilobite, one of the most common fossils, and it's very old. It's kind of like a horseshoe crab, and I have reptile tracks. You can still see the claw marks in them. Thank you. 
We'll be looking at some more different fossils here, but we also have things like um, ferns. We have some ripple marks, some different rock layers that we might have a chance to take a look at later. So we'll send it on back now to uh, learning about some more of the geology of the Grand Canyon. Hi everybody, welcome to Grand Canyon. My name's Andy Pierce. I'm a park ranger here at Grand Canyon. And we're gonna be learning about the stories that the rocks have to tell us. I've got two co-hosts with me today that are gonna be helping out. Hi, my name's Tori Savona. Um, I'm in sixth grade, I go to Draper Middle School, and I'm from upstate New York. Hi, my name's Colin Trunch. I go to Pinewood Elementary. I'm in fifth grade, and I'm also from upstate New York. Okay, excellent, you two. We're gonna, take, we're gonna take you on a journey into the canyon and learn some about the rocks and what they have to tell us here today. First of all, let's start off with a couple of basics about geology. We've got three main families of rocks, all three which we see here at the Grand Canyon. You wanna tell us about them, Tori? Well, there are three rock families, Andy. Sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic. Why don't you tell us about metamorphic? Okay, metamorphic rocks are rocks that have been changed by heat and pressure such that we don't even recognize sometimes what they originally were. So these are rocks, and we see them down here at the bottom of the canyon, that, that have been changed, like I said, by heat and pressure. Colin, you want to talk about one of the other rock types? Um, I'll talk about igneous rocks, and igneous rocks are formed from a volcanic mountain that has erupted, and the, the magma or lava has cooled into rock. Excellent. And, Tori, would you like to talk about sedimentary rocks? Sure, why not? Sedimentary rocks are made by mostly gravel, mud, sand, and water. Excellent. And those things have been hardened together and formed into rocks. The most common rock type we definitely see here is sedimentary. And that's what we're going to talk about today for the most part. The hard metamorphic and igneous rocks are found down in the bottom of the canyon out here and layer upon layer of sedimentary rock have a lot of stories to tell because they have lots of fossils. To start off with, I'm going to send Tori and Colin on a time-traveling adventure back in time to see what you can find out about what some of these layers have to tell us. So let's go, you two. Give you one pack. They're going to go off on a time-travel adventure. And we'll see you two in a little bit, all right? Meanwhile, I'm gonna talk about some of the other layers that we have here at Grand Canyon. Because like I said, this is like a time travel journey and we see a variety of fossils here that really help tell the stories here. If we start down in the canyon, we've got the old, some of the oldest sedimentary rocks that we're gonna talk about today, which is the Bright Angel Shale. We look at a shale and we see mud, we see we see worm burrows. We see trilobites like Ben had showed us just a few minutes ago. We saw some trilobites that give us an idea that at one time there was a shallow, muddy sea here. As we move up through the sedimentary layers coming closer to today, we see the red wall limestone where we see ancient squids and other sea creatures that again tell us of a shallow sea. Moving up further, we have the Supai group. This was, here, this was being deposited at a time when Arizona had the coastline. We had the beaches. California wasn't here attached to the North American continent yet. So Arizona was the beachfront property. Come up a little bit further, and we even see ancient deserts in the Coconino sandstone. We see some, we see some reptile tracks. We see liz or, um, spider tracks, scorpion tracks giving us evidence of a large Sahara-like desert that covered much of Western North America. And do I understand we had a caller on the line? Okay, Scout from Texas, go ahead. How many caves are there in the Grand Canyon? Huh? Out of those caves, how many are homes to bats? Okay, there are a lot of caves in the Grand Canyon. Anybody familiar with limestone who might live in uh, parts of the Midwest or more Eastern United States might be familiar with limestone because that's where we get a lot of our caves. Mammoth Cave National Park and other national parks are, for, are cave um, 
preserve caves that are formed in limestone. We have a lot of limestone here at the Grand Canyon. I don't know the number. There are a lot of them out there. Excellent question. Okay, we've got Tori on her way back from her time travel adventure. Come on over, Tori. Wow, where have you been and what have you seen? Well, Andy, I went to an ancient swamp. Excellent, what'd you see there? You've got some, let me see what you've got in your collections bag here. It looks like you've got some interesting things you collected. Here I Grand... collected um, some ferns and some mud. That's really Wow, nice. some ferns. We actually see some fern fossils here at Grand Canyon. We've got some in the Hermit Shale. And also, let me see what you've got here. Oh, a container full of mud. So it's pretty muddy there. I see you've got your big mud boots on. Excellent. You've got your, your insect spray, your fly swatter. Did you see any of those big dragonflies with the three-foot wingspans? Yes, they were horrible. All right. Well, the hermit, the hermit formation that we have here at the Grand Canyon is basically mudstone or shale. Mudstone is a type of sedimentary rock that forms from mud, and that's exactly where you must have traveled back in time to. That's excellent. Certainly in collections, we have lots of great, great fossils that preserve what we see in the hermit shale, a time when there was an ancient swamp here. And actually, Colin's coming back too. How you doing, Colin? Good. Where'd you just come back from? Looks like you've been having a good time. Here, I'll came, take a look at what you found. I came back from an ancient swamp. Ancient, uh, oh, an ancient ocean, it looks yeah, more I'm, like. You've been, ocean. All right, you've been out snorkeling, it looks like. You got your scuba, you got your snorkeling gear. Let's see what you found. A whole bunch of shell fossil, or a whole bunch of shells you found. Looks like you have, this looks like a stick-type bryozoan, like we see in the oceans today. We were studying this top rock layer we're standing on a couple of days ago. You guys remember we were doing that fossil study? What did we see in the Kaibab limestone, this top layer of rock? Do you guys remember what we found when we were doing our, our studies there? Um, we found a lot of different kinds of seashells. Excellent. Some of them looking fairly similar to this. Um, we found some brachiopods. Brachiopods, shell-like creatures. Okay, looks sounds like we have a question on the line. Let's. Yeah, I didn't hear the catch the name. Tabitha. Okay, excellent. Tabitha, go ahead. Um, that's Ingwer Elementary, Bedford, Indiana. Um, uh, my question is. How did the canyon get its name? How did the canyon get its name? That's an excellent question. Grand Canyon, if you look out into it, um, kind of almost speaks for itself, but John Wesley Powell, who was one of the early explorers here in the canyon, first person to, that we know of to run the entire river through the canyon, came up with a lot of the names, and he's the one, I believe, who ended up naming the, this canyon the Grand Canyon. Excellent question. Okay, so we found out that there are a lot of ancient, diff different types of ancient environments here that the Grand Canyon preserves. We see ancient oceans, we see ancient deserts, we see ancient swamps, we see ancient beaches. So there are lots of stories in the rock. Well, all we need to do is learn how to read those stories, understand the fossils, and we begin to get an idea of what kind of environments and some of the dynamic changes that have taken place here at Grand Canyon today. And do I understand that we have another question on the line? Okay, let's go down to Jacob, because I think he's going to be handling some questions. Jacob? Andy, thank you. You know, Tommy, I'd like to go in that time machine sometime. Me too. <laughs> I want to go to the ancient desert. Okay, let's, we'll see if we can get Andy to send us. <laughs> We've got Paige from Indiana on the phone. Paige, what's your question? Oh, hi, my name is Paige, and um, I was wondering, what kind of animals there are in the Grand Canyon. Paige, thank you. Tommy, what are, what's some, some of the animals you've seen? Well, there are thousands of animals. Some of the animals I've seen are different kinds of squirrels, elk, um, condors, ravens. Um, I know there is the pink rattlesnake that is only found in the Grand Canyon. That's right. There are Mexican spotted owls. And there's a various number of different birds, too. Yeah, and we're going to hear more about the plants and animals later in our show, Paige. So stay tuned. 
I think we have another caller, Savannah from Arizona. Go ahead, Savannah. My question is how many visitors go to the go down the trail every year and how much erosion happens? Savannah, was your question how many visitors visit Grand Canyon and how many hike the trails? No, it was um, how many visitors go down, down the trail every year and how much erosion happens. All right. Well, thank you, Savannah. You know, we get almost 5 million visitors a year at Grand Canyon, many of which do hike down the trail. Some of them just go a little ways just to see what it feels like to get below the rim of the Grand Canyon. Others will hike for weeks uh, at a time into the canyon. The exact number, I really don't know, but I would guess that it's well into the tens of thousands, Savannah. Thanks for your question. Um, right now we have Chase from Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Chase. Go ahead, Chase. Um, has there ever been any mudslides? Oh, good question. Yeah, actually, you know, just earlier this week, we had a lot of rain here at Grand Canyon, and one of the trails that we were hoping to hike on had a huge rock slide and mudslide on it, and it closed the trail. You know, the canyon is old, but it's continuing to form, and it's a dynamic place, and the weather is part of that. We're going to hear a little bit more about that as well. But what we're going to do first we're going to hear, you know, we've heard about all the rocks, got in the place, what happened next? And that question leads right into it. Andy, are you going to take us from here? You bet. I'm back here with Tori and Colin, and we're going to talk a little bit more about geology. Because we just talked about all the rock layers, and the fact that the topmost layer that we're standing on was deposited in an ancient ocean. However, if you're at the ocean, at the beach, what elevation are you at? Either one of you want to field that question? Um, you're at zero elevation. Okay, so zero feet. We're at, what elevation are we at right now? Do you remember, Tori? We're at 7,000 feet. 7,000 feet, which is why it's a little bit chilly out here today. Some people think of Arizona as hot, but it is a little chilly here today. We're at 7,000 feet. How is it that these rocks deposited underwater ended up at 7,000 feet? Well, we're going to come back to the theory of plate tectonics. I have a uh, globe right here in front of me. The black lines on here represent the plates on the earth. The crust is broken up into a series of plates. These plates are moving. And let's have a demonstration. Why don't you two demonstrate how basically this works. Plates can um, move in many different ways. They can pull apart, slide side by side. What happened here to cause these two plates to lift up, or to cause the crust of the earth here to lift up to 7,000 feet? Let's see it. They're going to demonstrate convergent plate boundary. Tori and Colin, let's see. All right, Tori is the plate diving down, Colin's the plate going over top. Basically, tens of millions of years ago, the Pacific plate, represented by this, and a North American plate, represented by this one in my left hand, collided together, Pacific plate dove down, the North American plate rode over top, and was pushed up, and hence our rock layers here have been lifted up 7,000 feet in some places, like here at Grand Canyon. Now, that's a very dynamic force. We've got all of our rock layers lifted up 7,000 feet in the sky. What's the next dynamic force that needs to be at work in order to get our canyon? Uh, erosion. Erosion, excellent, because we have the layers at 7,000 feet, but we don't have a canyon yet. Erosion, and what is it? that eroded the canyon. And let, let's, before we go to that, I think we've got a question. Could I, Dustin? Okay, Dustin, go ahead. Dustin, are you there? Hello? Hello, go ahead, Dustin. Do you have a question? This is Alex from, from Go ahead, with the, go ahead with the question. Well, maybe we'll come back to that question here in a minute. We're going to... What kind of plants they have in the Grand Canyon? What kind of plants? 
Well, we've got some plant specialists here with us today. And let's see, Lori, do you want to handle that question? Can you repeat that question? She was wondering what kind of plants we have here at the Grand Canyon. We've actually got a great diversity of plants here. We have 1,600 different species, and they vary from tall trees that you'd find up on the rim to really tiny plants down in the canyon that might only come out just after the rain. So there's a great diversity of species here. Great question. Excellent. Thank you, Lori. Yes, and so we'll continue with the power of water because water is extremely powerful. Plate tectonics is powerful, but water is equally as powerful as plate tectonics. And it has carved out our canyon. In fact, I was down in the canyon several months ago and saw some incredible evidence how even just one thunderstorm can make a dramatic change in the canyon and can start eroding, carrying rock down into the river below. Let's take a look at that, that footage. It was quite a spectacular scene. I'm down here about 3,600 feet below the rim on the Bright Angel Trail. Right here, if I had been standing here about five weeks ago, I would have been about th probably three or four feet underwater, actually. There's a raging torrent coming down here. Just downstream from here is Indian Garden, and you can see some of the effects of it down there as the flash flood carried away a lot of the picnic tables, um, did some damage down there. Um, certainly was quite a dramatic sight, but again, these are a great example of some of the processes that continue to widen the canyon even today. Okay, we're going to quickly demonstrate, before tossing it back to Jacob, how the canyon was formed. Let's review it. Okay, you two ready? Let's get down. We're going to teach them the Grand Canyon Boogaloo. If anybody out there wants to follow along, here we go. We're going to start off with that hard metamorphic rock at the bottom, forming the foundation of much of North America. That rock gets faulted and cracked, and then we have the igneous rock oozing through those cracks, and it cools and hardens. And then we get a layer of limestone and sandstone and shale, ancient oceans, ancient deserts, ancient beaches, ancient swamps, limestone, sandstone, shale, ancient oceans, ancient deserts, ancient beaches, ancient swamps. Here comes the Pacific Plate. Bam! Crashes into North America. Lift those rocks up 7,000 feet in the sky. 7,000 feet up, we've got the Colorado Plateau, but here comes the Colorado River, and the Colorado River carves down, and the walls fall in, and the river cuts down, and the walls fall in, river cuts down, and the walls fall in, and we have the Grand Canyon in a nutshell. Thank you. Back to you, Jacob. <laughs> well, we just, we just represent it. Yeah, we just represent how many millions of years? Um, Lots. That's <laughs> Right now, we have Hunter on the phone from Texas. Go ahead, Hunter. What name did the Native Americans have for the Grand Canyon and what did they mean? That is a really good question. Um, we have a woman who grew up here in the Grand Canyon who is a Hopi Indian, so we're going to toss it up to Phyllis. Phyllis, can you answer this for us? Yes, that's a great question. The word for the Grand Canyon in Hopi is <laughs> Dikpa. That means deep canyon. So that is the word in Hopi. Thank you. That was a great question. Thank you, Phyllis. Right now we have Brandon from North Carolina on the phone. Go ahead, Brandon. Um, this is Brandon, and my question is, what is limestone made out of? OK. Um, Jacob, you want to answer that one? Yep, Brandon, uh, that's a great question. And Andy was talking about the different types of sedimentary rocks that were formed here. But limestone was formed under ancient oceans. If you remember, um, who was it? It was uh, Colin who went back in time and came back from a limestone. And he found all those pieces of shells and things like that. And that's what forms limestone. They break down and they, and they uh, compact and form limestone. Thanks a lot for that question. We're going to go uh, to the next section. We are going to learn about some life in the canyon, so we're going to toss it to Chad and Lori. Hi, I'm Tori Savona, coming to you live from the top of the Grand Canyon. Today it's a little chilly, but we have beautiful condors flying around and these beautiful pine trees. Oh, well over to Jonathan at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Hi, thanks Tori. Uh, it's 20 degrees hotter down here than up there. And we have these scrub brushes, and there's no condors around here. 
and let's hand it to Julia. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, as you can see, we're in the middle of the Grand Canyon, and it's 10 degrees warmer than the outer rim of um, where Jonathan was. And there are no ponderosa trees, but there is some juniper trees. And I'm Julia Varch, and thanks for watching Canon TV. Great. Well, those are some fascinating stories about the different rock layers, about geology. And as the rock layers here tell stories of uh, changes over great and vast uh, periods of time, the animals and the plants, they also have stories to tell as well. And they're always having to change. You have to adapt or you don't survive. And so we've got some uh, biologists that are going to share some of these amazing survival stories with you. And I believe Colleen and her assistants have some great examples of adaptations and finding ways of making a living here at Grand Canyon. Colleen? Thank you, Jay. We do have several animal and plant specimens here that we thought we'd talk about. This is the Grand Canyon pink rattlesnake that somebody mentioned earlier. This is a bobcat, and this is a stellar jay that we see quite a bit around here at the Grand Canyon. And these guys have some things that they thought were special from our collection too. Ben, what do you have? This is pack rat Head up. midden. This is pack rat midden. It is junk that pack rats collected, and then they went to the bathroom on it, and it builds up, and sometimes they put their nest on by it. Great, thank you. What do you have, Carly? Well, this is the skull of a giant ground sloth. This mammal went extinct about 10 to 12,000 years ago. And it was around, it was alive around the same time as saber-toothed tigers, cave bears, um, giant beavers, and mammoths. Great, thank you. We're gonna go now and learn some more things about various plants and animals that we can find throughout the canyon. Let's go see what we can learn about those. We'll see you in a few. Hi, my name is Lori McCarrick and I'm a restoration biologist with Grand Canyon and we're actually going to start off the plant section with a question from Austin, I believe the name is, from Texas. Go ahead, Austin. Austin, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm from, I'm, I'm from Indiana. Oh, I'm sorry, from Indiana. All right, what is your question? My question is that when why did they put up cages in the bat caves? Why did they put cages in the bat caves? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Well, one of the caves that there are a lot of bats um, actually had artifacts in it, historic and prehistoric artifacts. And they put a cage on that cave to protect those artifacts. Chad, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the cage that you're talking about from the website, I believe, is a cave called Stanton's Cave. It was a cave that people could walk into, and like Lori was saying, uh, people were going in there and stealing artifacts out of there. So they put a door on there and, uh, to keep the people out, and then they had to modify that door to make sure that the bats could fly in and out as well. So I think that uh, hopefully answers your question. Great. Okay. Well, we're going to start talking about plants and I have some new friends here who will introduce themselves and then they're actually going to help us learn about plants. Go ahead, Jonathan. I'm Jonathan Yazi from Grand Canyon. I'm in eighth grade. I'm Bernie Ortiz I'm from Grand Canyon and I'm in fifth grade. I'm Berkeley Coger from Cowan Elementary and I'm in fourth grade. Great. Well, we've learned so much already about geology and how the canyon was formed and a lot of people, when they think of Grand Canyon, think of what's behind us, this vast landscape. We already mentioned that there's a great diversity of plants at Grand Canyon. We have 1,600 different species. I don't even know all of them. I'm just starting to learn them all. Um, as we change in elevation, does anybody remember how uh, much elevation difference there is between the north rim and the bottom? Jonathan, any ideas? 2,000? 2,000, it's a little more, it's about a mile actually. So the north rim is a little bit higher. In the bottom of the canyon, do you think it's warmer or colder right now? Warmer. It's warmer, yeah. So if we were down there, we might be able to take our layers off. 
So like, like us, the plants actually change as you go down into the canyon. Now these kids have been fortunate enough to have been able to take a hike down into the canyon. And I'm wondering, Berkeley, why don't you tell me what did you notice as we hiked down the trail that day? I noticed that in the bottom, all, uh, most of the leaves get bigger and like towards the middle, they're kind of smaller. Okay, good. Uh, did, how far down did we go? Did we go, um, you know, a couple miles or was it just about a mile? It was just about a mile, yeah, I Yeah, so just in one mile along a trail, we were able to see a really big difference in plants. On the top of the rim, Bernie, do you remember, were the plants really tall or were they just super short? Um, they were pretty tall. Yeah, they're really tall. In fact, if we were to go over to the north rim, there's a really dense forest over there with trees that look like this. They're, well, they're, this is one piece of a tree. Um, really tall trees over there. And as we go down, what happens to the leaves of the trees? They get bigger. In the very bottom where there's water, they do. Yeah, you can get really large leaves like that. This one here that has very small leaves that are kind of waxy, where do you think that would be found? The middle. In the middle, why? Because there's no water in the middle. It's exactly, all, yeah, so these, the great answer. Yeah, these plants have had to adapt to an area where there's really no water. So they've come up with very creative ways to actually survive in that area. I wonder if one of you could tell me what type of things plants rely on and what you think is the most important here. We've kind of already hit on this as far as a resource. They adapt to soil and soil, sunlight great. and water. Okay, good, good. What do you think that this plant, where do you think this would be found? Mostly at the bottom. At the bottom. What type of modifications or adaptations do you think this plant has made to life down there? They can keep water in its pads. Yeah, so the pads are really thick and they can actually store water in there. Do you see big leaves like on this plant? On no. this cactus? No. no. Do you think this has leaves? No, they have spines. Spines. Yeah, and actually the spines are modified leaves, so they've developed those spines. What else do you think the spines might be good for? Uh, to protect it from animals. Exactly. Yep, that's a great answer. If I were an animal and I came up to take a bite out of this, I'd get a mouthful of spines. Good answer. We talked a little bit about how oftentimes plants and animals really rely on each other, sometimes actually for survival. Did you learn about any relationship in which a plant and animal really need each other? The kaibab Jonathan? squirrel. Kaibab squirrel, good. What type of plant does it rely on? Trees. Right. Do you remember what type, Bernie? Uh, the ponderosa pine tree. Ponderosa pine. Right. So the trees actually protect the squirrels. I think we're going to go over to Jacob for some questions now. All right. Thanks, Lori. The... Right now we have a question from Indiana. Um, Aaron, go ahead with your question, Aaron. How did the canyon turn from, such, from a small sea to such a dry place? Well, all of this is done by the force of water, weathering, and erosion, and some other wind. It's really an amazing thing, the force of this kind of nature that can make such a small, little tiny thing turn into a humongous canyon. All right. Good Tommy. We got Bobia now from South Carolina. Bobia, what's your question? My question is what kind of minerals are found? in the Grand Canyon. All right, what kind of minerals are found in the Grand Canyon? Well, you know, Bobby, some of the, Bobby, some of the early explorers who came here were actually miners, and they came to mine some of those minerals out of the canyon walls. Some of those were copper, asbestos, and more recently, actually the last mine closed in 1964, was uranium. So there are a lot of different, uh, minerals here that people have tried to mine and have successfully mined. It's just hard to get it out of the canyon. Thanks. Our next question is from Ryan from Indiana. Go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead, Ryan. Um, has anybody ever got hurt in the Grand Canyon like this by snake? And if they have, how have they, how did they get them out? Um, people have been hurt in the Grand Canyon. Um, I think I'm going to ask Jacob to finish that one up. I'm not totally sure about that one. All right. Thanks, Tommy. But you're right. People do get hurt. They have to be careful. 
animals are wildlife here and they're wild and in their habitat so you have to be careful when you approach animals and we do have uh, poisonous snakes here and actually that's a great segue to our next section Tommy and what are we going to talk about next? Next we're going to talk about animals that's and we're right. going to go up to our expert of animals Chad. Hello, my name is Chad Olson. I'm a biologist here at Grand Canyon National Park. We're going to talk about some of the animals that we find here at Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon is really diverse in the wildlife that we have. We have over 350 species of, of birds, uh, about 90 species of mammals, and about 47 species of reptiles. Now there are a whole bunch of animals I'm not naming, but it's very, very diverse here at the canyon, mainly because of the huge elevation difference be, from the rim down to the canyon as Lori kind of talked about a little bit before. So some of the species found here at Grand Canyon are only found here in this area. These are called endemic species. Uh, Berkeley, can you uh, mention a, um, can you name an endemic species for us? Yeah, um, the Mexican spotted owl is one. Mexican spotted owl is not endemic, but it is threatened or endangered. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Bernie, can you uh, name an endemic species? A kaibab or average squirrel. Kaibab squirrel is a good example. The Grand Canyon pink rattlesnake is another endemic species to Grand Canyon. Now we also have a number of threatened and endangered species here. Uh, Berkeley, now you can name one of those. The Mexican spotted owl. Mexican spotted <laughs> owl. Okay, excellent. That is one of the threatened and endangered species here. We also have a very large bird that's uh, threatened and endangered. One of the most endangered birds in the world. What bird is that, Jonathan? The California condor. The California condor. Excellent. It's one of the most endangered birds in the world. Berkeley, how big do California condors get? Well, their wings can get up to nine to nine and a half feet, and their uh, weight can get up to 24 pounds. Exactly right. Up to 24 pounds. To put that in perspective, a bald eagle weighs on average about 10 pounds. Let's uh, hold up a couple things here to show how big these birds are. Berkeley, if you want to hold that. This is just one feather of a California condor. And then this here is a full-size, life-size banner of a California condor. Berkeley, you want to move back over this way a little bit? Just down there. So that gives you an idea of how big these birds actually are. Okay, great. So. California condors, to give you a little bit of history, there are only 22 birds remaining at one point back in 1982. And in 1987, the last bird was trapped from the wild to start a captive breeding program. So the captive breeding program was very successful. And by 19, uh, the early 1990s, they started reintroducing birds to the Grand Canyon area. Um, in about how many birds exist here in Arizona right now, Berkeley? Do you um, know? About um, 85, um, 89. A little yeah. bit below that. We're right at about 48 birds here in Arizona. Okay, so we have a caller coming in from Indiana, I believe. Tenson? Jensen. Okay, Jensen, go ahead with your, with your question. Okay, my question is, what is the law of superposition? The law of superposition. Okay, I think we'll have to uh, throw that one back to Andy. Uh, Andy, can you take care of that question? You bet. The law of superposition. Wow, somebody knows a big word out there. That's a big word that actually means a really pretty simple concept. Basically, oldest rocks are at the bottom, youngest rocks are at the top. That's what the law of superposition is about. So if you want to press your friends, families, and teachers, Remember, law of superposition, oldest at the bottom, youngest at the top. Thanks. Back to you, Chad. All right. Thanks a lot, Andy. Okay, so we were talking about California condors. The birds were reintroduced here in about 1996, and there are a lot of uh, questions about whether they would, uh, how they'd act in the wild and whether they'd breed successfully. Uh, in the last year, we finally had our, su our first successful breeding, and uh, this year, again, we're hoping to have two more nests with uh, chicks raised in the wild. So things are looking very, very good for uh, California condors. So the, uh, the other thing we're going to show real fast is demonstrate how to track. And we have Berkeley here with a transmitter and a wing tag that every bird wears. 
And uh, do you guys want to show this real fast? Okay, turn it on there, Jonathan, and hold it up so they can hear it, if they can get that, that uh, audio. Now, every single bird, it's really important that we keep track of them, and this is how we do it. We have the directional antenna, the receiver, and the transmitter. Okay, so that takes care of condors, uh, a species that we're trying to restore. Now we're going to uh, hear from Lori again about species that don't really belong here and what we do about it. Lori? Great, thanks Chad. We've talked a lot about the native species and we mentioned that there's 1,600 native plant species. What do you think it's called uh, the species that aren't native to Grand Canyon? Non-native? Non-native, great. What, do you know what another name for that is? Exotic. Exotic, exactly. How many species of plants do you actually think are not native to Grand Canyon? We haven't talked about this one, so this will test you. If we have 1,600 species, how many do you think are not native to the park? Uh, Take a guess. Six, 600? 600. That's actually, luckily, that's really high. We've actually got 170 that aren't native to the park. Um, Non-native species, do you think they all can cause a tremendous amount of damage to the native species? Yes. They can, yes. yeah. Some of them causing more than others. Let's see, Berkeley, do you remember what it's called for the species that really can cause a lot of damage to the natives? Invasive. Invasive, very good, excellent. Now, what are some of the characteristics that we talked about that these species can have? Go ahead. They can, uh, they roll around and blow off seeds so yeah. they can go everywhere. Uh, does anybody recognize what this is? Tumbleweed. tumbleweed. Tumbleweed, very good. So a lot of people are familiar with this plant. You see it blowing along the roadsides in the west. It actually grows, produces seed. When the seeds dry out and they're ready to actually produce new plants, it'll tumble along the ground. So it's a really creative mechanism for dispersing its seeds. I actually was taking a walk this morning and when I was going through the woods, I was going through a patch of a non-native grass. <coughs> and what I noticed is that I've got a lot of the seed in my sock. So that's another super creative mechanism for plants to disperse their seeds. So what would happen if I were to go down to Tucson this afternoon? Um, the seeds would go to Tucson. Yeah, so I'd be taking those seeds with me. And that's actually how a lot of these non-native species came into the park. What are some of the things that you can do, whether you're right here or at home, to help control or prevent the spread of invasive species? To leave them alone, leave the plants alone? Yeah, leave them alone. What about something you did this week? You really learned a lot about native plants. That's important too, like you know which plants are native and which are non-native. So there are things out there that you can do too. I think we're going to go back to Jacob for some more questions. Thank you, Lori. We are going to take another question. Who do we got? We have Kyle from Texas on the line. Go what? ahead with your question, Kyle. If there is now a dam on the Colorado River, will the canyon continue to get bigger? I'm sorry, Kyle, could you just repeat that? I know it's about the Colorado River and the canyon getting bigger. Oh. If there is a dam on the Colorado River, Will the canyon continue to get bigger? Well, yep. Well, Kyle, there is a dam there. Actually, all along the Colorado River water system, there's over 100 dams on that river. Wow. But you didn't know that. I did. And the one that's right outside of Grand Canyon National Park is Glen Canyon Dam. And that has had a big effect on the river. The canyon still will be getting bigger because the Colorado is still flowing and we have a lot of lateral erosion like Andy was talking about earlier. But the biggest impact that the Colorado, uh, the dam has on the Grand Canyon is affecting the habitat and the plants and animals that grow along the river. Thanks, Kyle. Right now we have Sarah from North Carolina on the line. Sarah, what's your question? How old is the Grand Canyon? How old is the Grand Canyon? Bet you it's older than Tommy. <laughs> um, I think it's 270 million years. Well, actually, Tommy, that's, that's a good answer if we were talking about the age of the rocks. And that's what confuses a lot of people. Kaibab limestone that we're standing on is 270 million years old. 
but actually the canyon itself is only about five to six million years older and that's when the river started carving through and that's sort of where we gauge the time that the canyon started. Oh. Ah, good Thank one. you Sarah. <laughs> um, right now we're going to toss to the trailblazers. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about geology, plants, animals. We still have the people. This has been the easiest hike I've ever been. I mean, it's so flat. I know. There hasn't been any hills or canyons since the Mississippi. How are we going to get across that? Hello again. So now we've learned some of the amazing stories of plants and animals and how they've had to adapt to, uh, to survive here and to, to make a living at Grand Canyon. Uh, we've not covered one very, very important story so far at Grand Canyon, and that's the story about people. And people uh, really are, are an integral part of the Grand Canyon history and the Grand Canyon story. And so the story of human beings at Grand Canyon go back thousands and thousands of years. And uh, our museum collection uh, has many, many wonderful artifacts. And I think Colleen and uh, her assistants can share some of those wonderful pieces to help, again, open up that history book. And let's take a look about the human story at Grand Canyon. Colleen? Thank you, Jay. We're back with some cultural items here, things that are found throughout the Grand Canyon that represent some of the early peoples that are found here. Ben, what do you have? I have, have, Mike, honey. I have oh, a um, basket made by the basket makers. It is over, about a thousand years old and it's worn out, so we keep it in this bowl with a cloth. Thank you. What do you have, Carly? Well, this is a sole of a sandal made from yucca and or agave fibers, and they put shredded bark on it to keep it soft. Wonderful. We'll be coming back later and looking at some of these other things, but let's go to our early native peoples expert and start learning about some of the people of the Grand Canyon. Hi, my name is Jan Balsam. I'm an archaeologist here at Grand Canyon. I've got two of my colleagues here with me. You guys introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Chelsea Fairhead. I'm in seventh grade and I go to Grand Canyon School. Hi, I'm Julia Barch and I live in Florida and I go to Don Esther High Tech Middle School. And we are going to start our session with a question from Zach from North Carolina. Go ahead, Zach. Um, how fast does the Colorado River flow through the Grand Canyon? Zach, that's a great question. He asked him, how fast does the Colorado River flow through Grand Canyon? And it varies a little bit, but generally about four to five miles an hour is the flow of the river through the Grand Canyon. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay. Well, we're here talking about native peoples. And uh, as much as the Grand Canyon is important for its geology, the plants and animal life, we also had people here living for 10,000 years. We have a single artifact that was found about 10,000 years ago. And I think Colleen is going to show that to us. Colleen? I sure am, Jan. Here is our Folsom preform. This is about 12,000 years old. This is the earliest example we have of humans in the Grand Canyon. There's one side, there's the other. It was found by accident by an archaeologist hiking in the canyon, but we're thrilled to have it. Back to you. You know, when you talk about trying to understand the human history here, it's almost like looking for a needle in a haystack. We've got 1.2 million acres, um, and we've gone out looking for some sites in the last couple of days, and it was kind of surprising as we were walking through the woods, finding things on the ground. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the earliest people here who were here about 10,000 years ago, um, hunters who were in this area, leaving small pieces of stone tools. And then about 4,000 years ago, there was another group of people who were also hunters who were living here, and they made small animal figurines called split twig figurines. And uh, we've been trying to make some of them, um, and I know that uh, folks in the classrooms have also been trying to uh, uh, make split twig figurines. There's an activity available for you on the website. And uh, uh, Colleen, I think you've got a couple real ones to show us. I sure do, 
Jan. These are two split twig figurines from the museum collection. This one has a spear in it. This one here is wrapped with grass. We believe they were meant to be either bighorn sheep and mountain goats or mule deer. The one with the spear in it was probably a hunting fetish help, uh, meant to help them with their hunting rituals and to make it a uh, more, more successful hunt. Back to you. Great. Well, I've been talking with my colleagues about the uh, figurine with a small spear running through it. Julia, what do you think that's all about? I think it stands for hunting and for food and nature and stuff. Hunting, yeah. And what do you think, Chelsea? Um, same thing? <laughs> yeah. Pretty much the same thing. You know, it's pretty hard to hunt a deer or a sheep around here. Um, we have a couple tools, though, that we know were used uh, prehistorically um, um, as part of the hunt. Now, do you think those would work uh, on a bow and arrow? No. Kind of a little too big for that? Yeah. Kind of heavy, have to be a really big bow and a really big arrow? Yeah. So most likely on a spear, and it would have been hafted at the end into a piece of wood and then used as a spear. So I think, I, actually, we've got another caller coming in. Uh, Amanda, I believe it is. Um, what is a petroglyph? What is a petroglyph, Amanda? That is a great question. Ah, we've got a couple of people who want to answer that for you. There's two different types of rock art. There's pictographs and there's petroglyphs. Who wants to answer which one? A uh, petroglyph is where you carve things into the wall. Mm -hmm. A petroglyph is when you, when you chip your, your, the, the image into the rock wall. And what's a pictograph? A pictograph is when you like paint it on the wall with mud and water. Mud and water. And you're actually making paintings, pictures on the walls. And petroglyphs are peckings on the wall. That was a great question, Amanda. Thank you very much for asking. Um, so we've talked a little bit about um, the oldest artifact, a little part of the Folsom Point. We've uh, shown our uh, skills at uh, making split twig figurines. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, projectile points. Archaeologists don't really ever call them arrowheads unless we know that they were using a bow and arrow. And I've got another little artifact here. I'll trade with you. What do you guys think that was? Probably um, a utensil, like a knife to exactly. cut their food up. Exactly. It was a knife because people had to fashion everything that they were using here out of what was available in the canyon. And all of these three pieces of stone tools, they're all called lithics, were made out of what? They were made out of all stone. Out of all stone. Canyon. All of it coming from the rock layers here. Exactly, exactly. So pretty interesting stuff. Um, and all of these things, thousands and thousands of years old. It looks like someone painted on that one. It looks on like this it, one? Yeah, it looks like it was fake. Yeah. It does, although, you know, there's a number on this, and that's, that's the site number, so we actually know where it came from. It's one of, one of the tricks that we have. Okay, so we've heard about uh, a little bit about hunting and things like that. What about a um, little later peoples? We had peoples living here who were hunting, and then we began to have people who were farming. And I know Ben already showed us a basket. Do you think those people were called who made baskets? Uh, farmers. How about Maybe. basket makers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, basket makers. And they were living here maybe 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago. And later people called Pueblo people were living here, and they were farmers. And we've talked a little bit about that. Where would they be farming, do you think? Probably by the river. Down so, back below us? Yeah. So that they'd have enough water to make sure their crops would grow correctly. Yeah, exactly. And they were, they were farming corn, beans, and squash. Mm -hmm. And we've had a little bit of experience here with corn in the last couple uh, days. You know, one thing, if you're living here, you're going to have to make everything that you have in your kitchen uh, right here out of what's available. And we actually have been practicing a little bit with uh, grinding corn. Um, you guys want to show folks how that works? Okay, usually they use a bigger rock. <laughs> And the big stone here is called a matate. The small stone is called a mono for your hand. You guys want to show them how, how it's done? First you have to crush the corn. We like to cheat. <laughs> They're cheating a little bit. But it works pretty well. And then we actually ended up making some fry bread the other night out of this. And then you just grind it up. All right. Well, thanks, you guys. It looks like uh, we're uh, going to toss this one to Jacob. Question time. Thanks, Jan. God, 10,000 years of human history here. It's amazing. It, right now on the line we have a caller from Missouri. Go ahead. Her name, I think it's Savannah. Savannah. Sa Savannah, are you there? Yeah. What's your question? What? 
kind of, and again, this, you know, the Grand Canyon. Thank you, Savannah. We talked about that a little earlier, didn't we? We talked about some of the Native American tribes that have uh, associations with those. Can you remember some of those tribes? Um, there's the Hopi, we have Navajo. We have Havasupai, Wallapai, Apache, and Paiute Indians. But the only ones that now live inside the canyon are the Havasupai Indians. Thanks, Savannah. Thank you. Right now on the line we have Graham from Indiana. Go ahead. What's your What's your question, Graham? Hi. I'm wondering if there has ever been a volcanic eruption in the Grand Canyon. Um <laughs> <laughs> You don't know that one? Not exactly sure. Actually, I yes. I think there is, but you, you're absolutely right. That's a good guess. And actually that's some of the most recent dramatic uh, geologic events we've had here, Graham, and in the western part of the Grand Canyon, there have been volcanoes erupting, and actually those volcanoes had incredible lava flows. Just about two weeks ago, I was on the Colorado River, Colorado River on a raft trip going by these lava flows that 11,000 years ago dammed up the Colorado River, forming a big natural lake there. Of course, the Colorado River is a powerful force. It's course it's carved the whole Grand Canyon and it cut through those lava flows. So yes, volcanoes do have erupted here at Grand Canyon. Thank you. We now have Christy from South Carolina. Go ahead. When mining claims failed, how did many of the miners make a living? Well, that's a very good question. Well, you know, do you know the answer? Well, um, this week I learned that a lot of the um, people who were making making a living here, they um, realized that the food services made a really good living. And a very important person was Fred Harvey, who started many food services and hotels. That's right. You know, some of the early miners found out it was better to mine the tourists' pockets than to mine the minerals out of the walls. So those early miners became the first tourist leaders in tourism. We're going to go back to uh, Jan, I think, and talk a little bit more about some of the more recent arrivals here at Grand Canyon. Yes, we are. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Jacob and Tommy. You know, it's interesting to think about human history here and that we begin 10,000 years ago. We've got farmers living here 1,000, 2,000 years ago. And then a little over 100 years ago, you know, Euro, Euro Americans essentially came here. Before um, sort of Americans and the mining and tourists came here, uh, we did have the Spanish who uh, came upon the Grand Canyon in the late 1500s. Um, our friends, the Hopi Indians, a little to the east of us, brought them up here to the rim of the Grand Canyon. And um, I'm pretty sure uh, they just kind of left them here and didn't bother telling them how to get down. You guys, there's a trail here, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of trails here? Yes. Yeah. A lot yeah. easier. Sure. But uh, the Hopi didn't bother letting them know about any of that. They just left them here on the rim and said, good luck, we'll see you later. Um, after the Spanish were here, um, they really didn't spend much time. Um, miners came in, and that was a great question that we just had about mining. There weren't very many profitable minerals here. People were looking for gold. They saw all of this great geology and all these big rock faces and said, oh my God, it's going to be great. We're going to be able to find all sorts of th stuff. And they really couldn't find very much. So around the turn of the century, we began to see um, the miners who really couldn't make a living uh, going after um, tourists to make a living instead. 1901, the Grand Canyon uh, train showed up, the railroad uh, brought its first passengers up here. A little after that, um, we started having the beginnings of the lodges and food service, and I think Tommy mentioned a little bit of that. Um, beginning in 1905 um, and up into the 1930s, there was an architect working for Fred Harvey and the Santa Fe Railroad called Mary Elizabeth Jane Coulter, and I uh, know that we've talked a little bit about her. We can actually see one of her buildings over to the, uh, to the east of us here, the Desert View Watchtower, and all of her buildings had a theme um, talking about something with the Grand Canyon, the, the rocks, the um, cultures of the area, and trying really hard to emulate as much as she could um, some of the cultures and sort of the organic way that things grew out of the canyon using stone, um, in all of her buildings, oft times um, including uh, 
pictograph designs and petroglyphs that she actually took from ruins, which we would never do today, but she took them and actually incorporated them into her buildings. Um, she also um, had a long history here with many of the native peoples, and she spent a lot of time working with the Hopi people. And we happen to have someone here um, who grew up at Grand Canyon who didn't quite meet Mary Jane Coulter, but knew an awful lot about her. So, Phyllis, I think it's uh, time for us to talk to you. I am from the Eagle Clan, born for the Bear Clan, and I am a Hopi Apache Indian raised with Hopi beliefs. And today I have some partners here with me. I'm Bernie. Um, I'm in fifth grade and I live in Grand Canyon. I'm Berkeley. I'm in fourth grade and I live in Indiana. All right. And we are going to tell you a little bit about the Native Americans in the area. And we have nine tribes that have connections to Grand Canyon. On the North Rim side, we have three bands of the Paiute Indians, and we have the Zuni Indians from New Mexico. Berkeley, can you tell me? We have the Hopi and the um, Noi. Look up, smile. Go ahead, Bernie. The Navajo, the Havasupai, the Wallapai, and the um, Zui. The White Mountain and Apache. All right, good. So you learned about them a little bit while you were here at the canyon. And the Grand Canyon really has a lot of things to offer us, right? You've got a lot of plants, a lot of trees, the canyon itself, and all the Native American usage for the tr um, plants and animals. And here we have a pinyon tree. And Berkeley, what did you do with the pinyon tree? What does it give you? We, um, you can eat them and you can um, use medicine. You can eat the what? The pinion nuts. And what did you do with the pinion nuts? We um, roasted them. And you got to eat them, right? Yep. Right, and here's another plant behind us. It's called a sagebrush. And Bernie, what do we do with the sagebrush? Um, the hunters, they use it as their perfume. Good, so it, uh, it's a hunter men's perfume. Now I'd like to share with you um, a traditional dance that's going to be done, but I'd like to first introduce Debbie Estes with Best Buy. Thank you, Phyllis. I have with me um, Jonathan, and Jonathan is a 13-year-old at um, the Grand Canyon Junior High. And Jonathan, you are in an absolutely gorgeous outfit. I understand your mom made, but who taught you how to dance? My uncle James Pashlika. And um, why is dancing important to you? I'm sure in school you have plenty of things that you can do. Why is this really important to you? My uncle says that uh, when the world ends, there's going to be only one language, and that's the day that the world's going to end. So I want to keep my heritage alive. Fantastic. What, what, is, what are some of the activities that you do at school besides dance? I do sports like a football, soccer, basketball, baseball. I like bike riding too. So you have a pretty busy schedule, but I bet you I've seen Jonathan dance and um, I think by the time you see some of his footwork, he is probably awesome on the soccer field. So I know you told me that you teach children how to dance. Do you think you can teach me how to do something? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, let's give it a try. Here, I'm gonna What dance are you going to do for us today? The meaning of the hoop dance? The meaning of the hoop dance is health for people that are kind of disabled. And this is so they can get better. Okay, so here is Jonathan. Hey, 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 hey,
you so much for um, sharing part of your heritage with us today. I think if we hold this together, it means friendship. Yes. And with that, we're going to turn it to Jacob. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. That was excellent. Yeah, that was great. We were down here dancing <laughs> too. So we have a caller from Texas, Reese. Go ahead, Reese. How long, ha how long has the Indian Garden been in the Gar Grand Canyon? And did any of the Native Americans live in the um, Indian Garden or make use of it? Well, um, the Indian tribes have been living here in the Grand Canyon for over er, 10,000 years. Um, and yes, the Indian Garden was in use by the... Havasupai. Havasupai, and it's still used by them today. Well, actually, the Havasupai did live there. They're not there now, but a lot of hikers camp there when they go down. So, but the Havasupai were there until just recently. We now have Brady from Indiana. Go ahead, Brady. Brady, sorry. Hi, um, how, how did rivers and ponds get into the Grand Canyon from a long time ago? How did, how did um, rivers and ponds? Okay. All right, should we toss that one to uh, Jay or Andy? I think we should. All right, Jay or Andy, how did the rivers and ponds get into the Grand Canyon a long time ago? Well, that's a really, really excellent question. In fact, one of the mysteries, we've been talking a lot about geology, and we talk about you know, some of the stories that the rocks have to tell us. One of the big questions, and there are a number of theories about this, is how did the river end up in its present course and carve the Grand Canyon where it did? Because the river cuts through a high plateau here, uh, known as the Kaibab Plateau, and really, maybe if you become a geologist in the future, you can help find the definitive answer, because really, we're not 100% certain how the river got in its present course. Excellent question. Great. Thank you. Right now we have Elizabeth from South Carolina on the phone. Go ahead, Elizabeth. How many different kinds of rock is there in the, in the park? Oh, well, there are so many different kinds of rock in the park. Um, there's about 11 layers of the canyon that are the main layers. And um, a geologist once said there is a few over 90. Over 90 different types of rocks, yeah, that they can name. Good question and great answer, Tommy. Okay, now we have Reese from Indiana on the phone. Go ahead, Reese. Go ahead, Reese. Um, how, how many rock layers are there? Okay, well, there are 11 main layers of the canyon, and there, a geologist said that he could name over 90 um, other small layers, so. Yeah, All right. yeah. It actually, there are, there are about 11 layers, and if you go to our website, you can see those layers and learn about each, different, each of those there. So why don't you visit the website and you can get all the answers there. You know, we've heard a lot about a lot of different themes today. We've heard about, all, you know, humans here, rocks, all of that stuff. But we haven't really figured out how we keep this place so beautiful. Right, and that's part of the Park Service missions, to protect and preserve. Right now we're going to go up to Amanda Madison and Jay and Chad to learn about preservation. Hear something? Nah. Hi, my name's Amanda, and I'm from upstate New York. I'm from Pinewood Elementary School, and I'm in fifth grade. Hi, I'm Madison. I'm from the Grand Canyon. I'm in sixth grade. We've learned about the canyon all week, but we still haven't talked about preservation. Preservation. Madison, what did you like best? It was pretty cool when the condor flew over our heads. What about you? I liked when we were. We got to see the baby chick that was just born. 
in May through a telescope, so that was my favorite part. What, what can you do to help the canyon stay the same? Madison, what are some of the examples? Some things you can do is to leave everything where it is so that future people can come and see the same thing that you saw. You can also p leave, pick up your trash so that the animals can live. How you doing, Amanda? Madison? Good. So you guys were talking about uh, why people shouldn't litter. Uh, I wanted to, to show you something here real fast. If you guys want to hold that. Okay, let's dump all this stuff out. This is all stuff that we took out of a condor tra or a condor nest. Um, how did this get in the nest, Amanda? Well, because people leave their trash on the ground, so condors are very curious birds, and they pick up whatever they can get. Exactly. And uh, the, the condors, they think that some of the stuff is nutritional for them. They pick it up. It can actually cause uh, their chicks to die in the nest, so it's very important that people pick up every little bit. Also, we don't want to make we want to make sure people don't feed wildlife. Uh, we have a caller coming in, Toby, from uh, one of the Carolinas. Toby, go ahead. Hi. Um, when you find animals that are in injured, do you take them um, for care, or do you give them to other people to take care of? That's a great question. Um, what do we do with animals when they get injured? Well, we have permits so that when we find an injured animal, we can get that to that animal to someone who knows how to take care of it, a wildlife rehabilitator. And usually they can uh, end up rehabbing that animal back to health and hopefully be able to release it back into the wild. That was a great question. Okay, so I think now we're gonna talk uh, about some other things that people can do when they're here at the canyon to uh, help preserve it. Jay? Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Good to see you again, you too. Um, did you have fun during your visit here to Grand Canyon? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Well, most people do. When they visit a national park, they have a great time and they enjoy it and they want to tell other people about it. Um, is this the only national park in the whole National Park Service system? No. no. How many are there? Over 380. Yeah, 388 national parks out there. That means most likely there's a national park near where you kids are watching this program from. Now, uh, I believe we've got another call for you, Chad. Okay, Michaela from California, go ahead. Um, hi, I, I have a question. Um, when people were mining, did they find like gold or crystals? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question for me? When people were mining, did they find any gold or crystals? Did they find gold or crystals? Boy, well, they mined for a whole bunch of other uh, types of minerals. We might want to toss that back to uh, Andy or uh, Jan. Uh, Jan, do you want to take that question? Thanks, Chad. I'd be happy to. You know, people try to mine all sorts of things here. They found very, very small parts of um, gold um, along the river, but not enough to really sell it or make any money. They also mined copper, which is probably the most successful thing, um, uranium, asbestos, but really nothing else that you would be considered something that you'd really be interested in mining. Uh, the last thing they actually tried mining here was uh, something called bat guano, which was um, found in some caves in the west end of the canyon that was used for uh, fertilizer for uh, your house plants. So um, no gold here, a um, few other things, but mining really wasn't very successful. Thanks for that question. Okay, well thanks Jan for answering that. Um, yeah, so everyone out there, you can take it upon yourself to help preserve these parks. So hopefully we've given you a couple ideas here. Why don't we toss it back to Jacob and Tommy then, now for questions. Thank you, Chad. Um, right now we have Jack from North Carolina on the line. Go ahead, Jack. How hot does it get in the Grand Canyon? That is an excellent question. Near the top, it can get um, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right? At the rim. And as you go deeper, it can get, we can get 20 degrees hotter as you go down into the canyon. So I'd say about 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Down at the river, I wish it was close to that today because we're a little chilly here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have Jacob from Indiana on the line. Jacob, what's your question? 
Yeah. Have there ever been any dinosaur fossils found in the Grand Canyon? Ah, great question, Jacob. There have not been any dinosaur fossils found in the Grand Canyon. And why is that, Tommy? Because the whole Grand Canyon and the rocks were had already been formed before dinosaurs even were alive. Excellent, Tommy. I think we have Raven from Arizona. Are you on the line? Raisin, are you on the line from Arizona? <laughs> What's your question? I was wondering, is there a lot of um, rapids in the Colorado River? <laughs> well, there are tons of rapids in the Colorado River. It happens to be where me and Jacob are standing. If you look down, you can see the Colorado River, and you can see um, one of the rapids, Pants Rapid, which is a level 10 rapid, which is the biggest rapid. Good question. There are, there are a lot of rapids. There are over 200 rapids along the whole length of the Colorado through the Grand Canyon. And as Tommy said, they get up to level 10, which are some of the hardest rapids to run anywhere on a Whitewater River. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, it's been quite an adventure today, hasn't it? Definitely. <laughs> we just finished talking about preservation and the importance of taking care of our natural heritage here like the Grand Canyon. Absolutely, because if there wasn't the national parks, there would be, it wouldn't be as beautiful as it is right now. That's right. We've also talked about the humans that have come through Grand Canyon National Park. Yes. The plants and animals and what everybody comes to see, which is? The rocks in geology. Grand Canyon rocks. <laughs> so it's, it's been great. The themes for this show have been those. We've had a lot of fun with everybody here. But you know, this is, the fir this is just the first field trip in a series of electronic field trips. And Jay's going to introduce the next one that's going to take place in December. Jay, what do you have for us? Thanks, Jacob. Uh, we've got an incredible array of uh, uh, special features and field trips coming up. There's a total of six, including this one. The next one coming up is going to take us out of this world. We're going to go visit planet Mars. And planet Mars may seem like a world away. However, a lot of the stuff that we talked about today with geology, about sedimentary layers, about the colors and the minerals we find in the rock, you can apply to geology in, in different planets and on Mars. So the red rocks here of Grand Canyon, they have a lot to do with the same red rocks in, in uh, the planet Mars. So we look forward to, to, to seeing you again when you come and visit us in about a month's time, and we'll see you on Mars. Thanks. a wonderful adventure today and right now we want to thank some of our sponsors because this wouldn't have happened without them. First off we want to thank the Best Buy Children's Foundation. Also we want to thank the National Park Foundation. That's right Tommy and we also want to thank Grand Canyon National Park and the entire National Park Service as well as Ball State University. We also want to thank all of the audience and schools watching us and the, all the students also want to thank the teachers and the park rangers who have been teaching us so much this week. It's yeah. been absolutely incredible. 
We've had an incredible week, haven't we? Yeah. It's hard to, hard to believe that it's over, but it is. But you know, Grand Canyon National Park is here for all of you to come and visit. And we hope, Tommy, you come back, all your friends from New York, and the new friends you've made from Indiana and, and Florida and here, come visit us here at Grand Canyon National Park and we'll, t we'll take you on your own personal adventure. All right. Bye, bye everyone. Bye everyone, thanks. Oh, I will get high.